topic for this session is international multiple sports games. And uh, we are really honored that to have the Mr. Luis Luis, International Relations and Olympic Advisor of Quarta Olympic Committee, who has like more than 20 years experience in the sports world. So Luis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ivy. Good morning from Doha and good afternoon to you guys. Um, as Ivy said, uh, it's well, it's my pleasure to be with you guys and my honor. And hopefully what we will discuss today, which is going to be very brief, unfortunately, but time does not allow us to discuss more, will be beneficial. And hopefully by the end of our session, you'll have more questions that would interest each one of you uh, personally and not what we will actually give you in terms of uh, content. Uh, let me see if this is working. Can you see my old photo there? With my yes. hello on the screen? Yes, yeah. very handsome one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start by who am I? I am an architect and urban designer by academic training. Uh, graduated from Sydney, started studying uh, my architecture in Lebanon. And then we migrated to Sydney in the early 90s. And then I finished my degree there, did the master's in urban design. However, decided that that was not my passion. My passion was in sport. So I shifted careers completely when uh, a chance presented itself for me to work with the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games. So this is how I started. I started working with the NOC services department there. And then the rest, as they say, is history. Um, I've had a chance or I've had the pleasure to work on four aspects of sport. One, as uh, I'm, I'm going to shift it, actually, I'm going to start with two because that was my first start with sport uh, as, as an event organizer. I worked for, uh, as I said, for Sydney. And then after Sydney 2000, I shifted to Athens to work on the Athens 2004 uh, Olympic Games. Uh, and that was the end of my work in the Olympic Games organization. After that, I shifted to uh, Doha to work on the Doha 2006 Asian Games. Um, at the end of the Doha 2006 Asian Games, uh, we had a deal with the Qatar Olympic Committee, which was one of the uh, main stakeholders in the Asian Games at the time, and every time, to be honest. Uh, and then I started working with them right after we finished our assignment with the uh, Asian Games Doha 2006. That's when I started working with number one in the list, which is sport administration. Um, throughout the, uh, my years, from uh, 2000, early 2007 until now, uh, I've had a, uh, the pleasure to work on many, many projects and many games, including world championships. So uh, this uh, you've seen probably from the video that uh, was shared to you what, what uh, Qatar hosted in the last, let's say, 15, 16 years. Uh, most of these events, I've had the pleasure to work on them, of course, in different capacities, in some cases, purely international relations, some other cases I was working as, uh, I mean, not all the events actually were, were listed there because we had many um, smaller events than the ones that were listed. So I worked on, on marketing, I worked on uh, uh, a few things on operations, uh, executive office. So I had uh, I had the pleasure of working on that. That's uh, when we shifted to uh, we can shift to number three, which is major events participation. I've had the pleasure of being part of the uh, Team Qatar, uh, Olympic Team Qatar, if you want, because we have Olympic Team Qatar and we have Asian Team Qatar. I've uh, I've done only one Asian Games with them as part of the team as an observer. However, I've been uh, an integral part of the Olympic uh, Team Qatar in Beijing 2008. London 2012, Rio 2016, and hopefully next month in Tokyo, if everything goes okay, we're, we're working very hard to prepare for that, and uh, hopefully it will be a great Games and a very successful one. And uh, the last one was uh, major events coverage. I've had the, the pleasure also to work in media uh, as, as a senior Olympic analyst with the Be In Sports channel, which is the major uh, Olympic channel uh, in, in the Middle East and, and North Asia, uh, North uh, Africa region. It's called the MENA region. Uh, I've done over 250 uh, live hours in terms of live coverage for mostly for the games where I could not go, which means uh, lately it started with the Pyeongchang 2018 uh, Winter Olympic Games. With the Asian Games, we've done Jakarta Palembang 2018. We've done the uh, 
the youth uh, Olympic Games that happened in Lausanne and the youth Olympic Games that took place in Buenos Aires. So these are the games that uh, I could not attend. I was lucky enough to actually attend them behind a TV screen and not as a, as a just a spectator, but as an analyst with B in sports. Um, this is in brief. I mean, it's uh, we can talk for hours again, but uh, it's it's I'm trying to give you uh, the the uh, let's say the main parts of my experience, and this will tell you why we'll be talking about what we'll be talking in the in the next few minutes. Let's shift to the main aim of of uh, this very short presentation, which is the Qatar sports strategy. As you all know, Qatar is a very small country that. Uh, uh, is located in the in the heart of the Middle East. It's uh, close to UAE and Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, this is how it's it's bordered, either through uh, land or through sea. And uh, of course, we have Bahrain uh, also. Uh, and uh, it, it's as we say, it's it's a very small country in terms of land occupancy, but it's very big in terms of heart and in terms of ambition, specifically in terms of sports ambition. Um, it's a sporting culture. The whole Qatar environment, uh, uh, being, uh, uh, let's say, Qatari nationals or uh, people who are living in Qatar, uh, have a great passion for sport. Uh, as the QOC president, His Excellency Sheikh Jaan bin Hamad Al Thani, who, by the way, is the brother of our leader, and at the same time, uh, he's, he, he's, he's a very hands-on person in terms of leading uh, sport, which is a, a continuation of, of the great leaders that we had recently. Um, he said, we are determined to better ourselves, push our boundaries and break down barriers. So even though we are small, we always work hard to actually better ourselves all the time. And to, of course, when we say better ourselves, better our participation in the Olympic movement as well. And uh, part of our motto is that we have an ambition as Qatar uh, Olympic, fa uh, Olympic family, let's say, and Qatar Olympic Committee, uh, uh, to actually become a global leader in sports and bring the world together through sustainable sports development. And this is actually not only the motto of Qatar Olympic Committee, but it's part of the national vision, which is called Qatar National Vision 2030. Uh, hopefully, when they come up with, with the next vision, because you know quite well countries work by, let's say, number of, of years, hopefully with the next vision will be also a, a major part of that. Um, the whole country, not only leadership, is driven by desire, by vision, by passion, and by purpose. And it's very important to have purpose because this is a goal that you have something tangible to reach. If it's only passion, vision, desire, they're all like emotions. But if you don't have the emotions, you can't reach your goal. Let's start by uh, showing you a small video that uh, gives you a bit uh, of an introduction to uh, a little more details that we, we will talk about later. At the Qatar Olympic Committee, we know that sport has the power to transform lives and bring the world closer together. Over the past decade, we've achieved outstanding sporting success in Qatar. And now we're ready to take this to even greater levels. We have developed a new strategy that will unite our entire sporting family behind one shared vision. A vision to create a more active society, improve sporting performance, and be a leader in promoting and supporting the Olympic movement. It all starts with encouraging and empowering our whole community to be involved in sport. Girls, boys, young and old. Participating, attending, organizing, excelling. Working upwards to build our elite athletes, identifying, nurturing, and developing a new generation of Qatari sporting champions, and facilitating excellence across our entire sporting landscape. Coaches, administrators, technical experts, everyone united to improve, progress, share, and push the limits of what is possible. Qatar's development into a global sports hub will be progressed to support the development of our nation, driving economic, tourism, and business opportunities through our hosting of world-class sports events and the utilization of our state-of-the-art facilities, spreading the power of Olympism and inspiring our nation to set their goals higher 
and push their boundaries further. This is the start of a new, exciting chapter in Qatar's sporting journey. Together, taking sport in Qatar to greater heights. So hopefully this uh, is a continuation of the video that you had a chance to uh, to see before. That one was more about details in terms of uh, events, in terms of uh, some of the venues, in terms of infrastructure. Uh, but it shows you that Qatar sports strategy is simple, but very sophisticated. It's not something that uh, is unreachable. However, it's because of dedication, because of, 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 of uh, let's say, commitment that this whole strategy is working as planned and it's being changed along the way to actually fit with the circumstances that are governing the whole uh, landscape. It's uh, as we said before and in the a couple of slides back it's it's a national priority it's part of the Qatar national vision 2030 and it's supported by everybody in Qatar living uh, nationals uh, residents uh, let's say uh, expats and most importantly, it's covered by all layers of the government, starting from His Highness the Emir, uh, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, who happens to be an IOC member in Qatar, and all the way down to the to the smallest, uh, let's say, uh, government employee. So everybody is supporting uh, this strategy, and everybody works together as one towards fulfilling this. Now. For me, of course, people will have different interpretations. For me personally, I see three major factors as to how this whole strategy is being uh, uh, successful so far. First, we have a clear vision. Then we have a solid overall strategy of how to deliver this vision. Sorry, and then we have the tools. If you don't have the proper tools, you will not be able to deliver the strategy to fulfill your vision. So the clear vision was defined by our national leaders. And that started in the, uh, in, in fact, not with the, with our current leader, with his father, who was the leader uh, just before the uh, Doha 2006 Asian Games, around the uh, late 90s, when they decided to bid. And I'm saying they because at the time I was not here. Uh, they decided to bid for the Doha 26, uh, 2006 Asian Games, and from then on, uh, history was started to be written. Uh, the good thing about this clear vision or the, the successful aspect of it is that it's shared by everybody, by all stakeholders, being Qatar Olympic Committee, being the government, being the private sector, everybody is sharing this vision. So everybody is working hand in hand in, in, a, in a one uh, defined path. Of course, uh, as we said before, the vision needs a strategy. So we have a very solid overall strategy that was drafted uh, uh, in the, let's say, towards the end of the 90s. And it included many aspects of it. We're not, we don't have time to, to detail all of them uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the next presentation, the one that you will see later and in a couple of weeks, you will see a bit more details, but also we can discuss them in the uh, questions and answers if you have something specific that interests you. But this overall strategy included hosting major events and we've succeeded, uh, thank God, to actually host not only the uh, Asian games, but we've, as you've seen in the, in the first video, that we've succeeded to host world championships for major sports, and we're still doing that by hosting the uh, the football world, uh, the FIFA World Cup next year. And we have uh, judo and uh, uh, the aquatics world championships, the FINA World Championships in 2023. And of course, hopefully, we'll have more more events as as thing uh, or as the days unfold. Um, sports, of course, we don't only host events for the sake of hosting events. Uh, we host events in order to develop our sports. So sports development was in, included in it. Uh, city branding, I mean, let's let's face it, every city that actually bids for major tournaments or major cultural events, not only sports events, they look to brand the city, they look to position and, and to create uh, vis vis visibility for the city and their region, whatever uh, the geographical, uh, let's say, uh, structure is. Um, and of course, we have relationship marketing, which means you build relations and you start uh, putting seeds for the future, because eventually uh, the more uh, events you host, the more, let's say, uh, activity you have, the more you become visible and the more friendships you have that you can count on when you go and bid for, for events in the future. Um, as we said, without relevant tools, you cannot really fulfill uh, your vision uh, through using the proper strategy. 
Um, and the, the relevant tools for me, they are two, two, two uh, let's say two aspects of it or two uh, kind of big groups. The soft tools, which are building human resources, building capabilities, and building on the uh, events that we hosted starting from uh, 2006, even before that, but let's say because 2006 was a, was a major milestone uh, in, in the history or in sporting history of Qatar, even, even the history as well of the, of the nation. And then we build on it. So we have now, we can say that we have existing knowledge and expertise. Of course, all this gathered through hosting these events and learning lessons and making mistakes Nobody's saying that we're perfect, but we try in our best every time. And sometimes we make mistakes, but we try to rectify them along the way and learn from them. So hopefully by the, by the next event, we don't do those mistakes. We do other mistakes. Of course, nobody's perfect. Uh, and, and so we build experience. And most importantly, and I need to repeat this, that we build relationships, relationships with every stakeholder within the Olympic movement and every stakeholder sometimes even within the commercial world, because let's not forget that uh, events, be it cultural, sporting, whatever, they need sponsors, they need backers. So all these relationships are being built uh, with the government, with uh, even, even internally, I mean, not only externally, but uh, with the government internally, with the Olympic movement externally, be it uh, Olympic committees from Asia, from the world, be it national federations, uh, be it international federations. So all these uh, Olympic movement stakeholders, they're all going to be uh, uh, more familiar with what Doha has to offer. And uh, to be honest, I mean, uh, the, this, the photo that you see on, on the right side, uh, this was not included, I believe, in the, uh, in the video. But uh, uh, this, this is kind of a special story on its own. This is the Anok World Beach Games, the first, the inaugural one. And uh, uh, because everybody knew what Qatar could offer, after uh, these games were supposed to be held in San Diego and the U.S., and San Diego uh, backed away because of uh, difficulties they didn't specify, but it's it's a combination of financial, uh, uh, political and all that difficulties. So uh, the ANOC people came to us and we managed to actually host games with 100 NOCs participation in literally three months and one week. So that if they didn't actually have uh, confidence and trust that Doha could deliver, they would not have come to us. Of course, we didn't sleep for a couple of months. My wife forgot how I looked like, but nevertheless, that was not the issue. The issue is we delivered a very successful event. Thank God for everybody's cooperation, including uh, a team from, from uh, the Chinese Taipei Olympic Committee was also here. Uh, moving to the hard tools, and this is what you will see in more details in the, in the presentation pre-recorded presentation that you will see later. Uh, this includes stadia. We have uh, a bunch of stadiums in, in or a stadia in, in Qatar. That's all state of the art. It's, it's amazing what we have. And in the background here, you will see something like a small kind of blue, uh, uh, blue dome, let's say. This is the dome of Aspire. And Aspire was the heart of the Asian Games in 2006. But of course, it was refurbished altogether. We have uh, the stadium, which is in the forefront of the photo. This is one, this is one of the stadia of the uh, FIFA uh, 2022 World Cup. But the dome has a specific story. It's actually host, uh, housing now as an academy. And this academy has uh, gradu from this academy graduated a couple of world champions. And this is part of the sports, uh, uh, let's say, development program that's been part of the whole strategy. One of them is the current world champion in high jump and the current uh, silver medal uh, Olympic champion as well. His name is Motas Barsham. Hopefully he will do better in, uh, in, uh, in Tokyo. He's preparing himself, let's hope. But he's a graduate of the sports development program that came out of uh, Aspire, which was uh, inaugurated just before the Asian Games in 2006. Of course, uh, it's not, we're not talking only about stadia, we talk about IT systems. You can't have uh, uh, major events or even minor events if you don't have a, a good IT system these days, integrated one. Uh, of course, urban infrastructure, we've seen in the couple of videos uh, that, that uh, you've seen so far. Uh, if you had a chance from, for, if any of you was here in, in, let's say, 10 years before, or in the Doha 2006 Asian Games, if anybody is as old as I am, for example, I'm hoping that you're all young enough, but uh, nevertheless, if you visit Doha, or if you had a chance to visit, Doha since then has been developed completely. It has been transformed into a, another place. More roads, uh, more a, a new airport, new metro, uh, more tra transport network, 
uh, a lot of not only urban infrastructure, but we have more hotels, more. So a lot of services and a lot of uh, infrastructure elements have been added and the city is still developing. And that's that's one of the actual, uh, uh, let's say, pluses that uh, in, in our recent uh, negotiations with the IOC, when we, we because we are part of the dialogue and it's no secret of, of to host future yeah. Olympic Games. Um, one thing that impressed them is that sport is part of the national development. It's, we're not changing the city in order to host events. Events come inter, an integral part of the city development. So regardless, for example, if we were going to host major events or not, we were still going to add stadia, we were still going to add roads, we were still going to add bridges, we were still going to uh, improve our IT systems, our uh, transportation network. So it's all like a one big system. And this is a, a very big plus to the IOC and to all the, the owners of the major events in, in the world. Of course, none of this would have been, uh, let's say, feasible if you don't have a communication strategy that is well defined and that's well thought of. It's led by QOC in cooperation with, uh, uh, there is a small unit in the government called the Government Communication Office which uh, uh, they, they work together hand in hand to make sure that uh, this communication strategy that's supported by everybody, private, public sector, national media, uh, all the stakeholders in the country and outside, including our, our embassies and all that, and including our, let's say, like uh, Paris Saint-Germain, which is one of the investments of, of Qatar. Also, it's, it's, uh, it plays its role in terms of, of uh, 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 the messaging uh, strategy that we have. Uh, and, and which I was going to say that it's very important in, in any communication strategy, the timing of the messages that you want to send. And it's very important to understand the, the customer groups or the audience that you want your, uh, your message to be heard within. So all this would not have been possible without a very good, uh, well-drafted communication strategy. Uh, again, I repeat myself uh, and allow me to say that nothing is perfect. We've always had uh, a few mistakes here and there. But once you learn and, and in, uh, once you work in events, actually, you can understand and you can, you can discover that you will make mistakes. Your character will be built and your reputation will be, will be held high, uh, defined by the way you react to the message, to the issues and, and to the mistakes that you have. If you react properly, if you look at it from a positive point of view, thinking, yes, we've done a mistake, but let's find a solution and let's adapt and adopt that solution, then people will look at you in a high because they understand everybody makes mistakes. Things happen like we went to Rio and we had so many problems in the village, but uh, uh, all credit to the people who were there. They were very, very, very good in responding to whatever needed we had or needs we had. Of course, some, sometimes uh, things are out of your control if it uh, involves the government and the government has its, uh, its, its flaws, let's say. Uh, you try your best, but as long as you try your best and you try to rectify, everything goes well. And the same happens with communication strategies because don't forget, you're, you're, actually it's your country against the world, if we can put it this way, in, the com in communication. Um, uh, this is in brief. I tried to be as brief as possible in, in the first section of, of uh, today. Uh, now it's uh, it's time for questions and it's time for discussions. And uh, allow me to start by uh, uh, Ivy had a couple of questions for me. So if we can start with her and then <laughs> hopefully you will have more more questions uh, from your side. Thank you yes, for listening. Yes. Thank you, Louis. And before I, I throw out my questions, I would like to invite all our participants to open your camera so we can let Luis uh, see all your faces and know that you are take part in these sessions. Can Thank I you. also can I yes. also uh, stop sharing my screen so I they can see yes, my face? Yes, of course. Too? Yes, we need to have your big face. Can you see me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Clear. One. It's, uh, my, my, my photo is a bit different. The other one that you saw in the presentation was from the studios of uh, of being sports. Now it's it's me. It's yeah, me it's, now after, it's after three months of lockdown. <laughs> OK, my first question is, could you briefly talk about how many years ahead it has Quata started preparing the bidding for the 2030 uh, Asian Games? OK, I have two uh, sides of the answers, if, if you allow me. The first side is, as we presented as part of the strategy to be ready for whatever major event comes up. OK, um, one of them, as we said, was the QNOC, uh, sorry, the, the ANOC, uh, yeah. ANOC Beach Games, which we didn't think of it four months or five months 
before the start. However, the Asian Games was always on the map. We were waiting for the right opportunity and the 2031 presented itself. Uh, if we want to say technically, it took us only one year from the time that uh, the OCA uh, invited the NOCs to uh, express their interest until even less than a, than a year. We started a, a month, let's say, before the expression of interest because we were wanted to, to do a feasibility to see uh, we wanted it to be a step towards the uh, the main aim for, for us, which is the Olympic Games. And since uh, we were in dialogue with the IOC to uh, to host uh, future Olympic Games and our main aim, to be honest, from the dialogue was 2032, unfortunately for us, but fortunately for Brisbane, it's going to be presented to the IOC session. Uh, so uh, we wanted to host the Asian Games as a stepping stone before the, uh, the uh, Olympic Games. And let's not forget, I mean, most of the generation that worked on the Olympic Games, uh, sorry, on the Asian Games, Doha 2006, is probably now if not retired, about to retire. So they will give uh, the experience and they will pass it on to the next generation. However, it's not the same as when people experience the games. So it's uh, experience the organization, experience the problems, the, uh, the, the, the long, the, the endless hours of, of uh, working on organizing a, a major event. So um, I would say uh, uh, from a technical point of view, about one year, from uh, December 2019 until Dece December 2020. But in terms of, of uh, readiness, we were ready from 2006. Wow. <laughs> yes, and this is when we started uh, hosting more and more events. Okay, so what are the strategy what our government implement when reaching out to uh, all the stakeholders, as you mentioned, the public and private section, to fully unify and prepare for the bidding? Yes, um, this is, I can give you some, but I can't give you all. If you're allowed, because <laughs> you have there to are give me a national, secret. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are some national, uh, let's say, uh, strategies that uh, I'm not entitled, even I don't know it because it's it's limited to a very small group of people. Usually it's the, the higher leadership of the country. But as I said before, uh, uh, there is a very, the good thing is that everybody here works as one unit. So uh, we have a government uh, communications office that works as the, let's say, the hub of the communication of the country overall. And then we have the, the, the different entities that work uh, uh, with the government office, a communication office. The major uh, entity in sport is Qatar Olympic Committee, because we have, for example, the World Cup. They, they work as an entity on their own now because of the size of the project. But uh, after the World Cup finishes, QOC will take back the leadership in all the most of the sports, especially in all Olympic sports. But for now, uh, QOC was the leader, and then we actually do campaigns in 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 uh, let's say in the country to try to gather the, the public support, and then the government office uh, communications office will actually support us and will be like a consultant to us if they see that there is something that doesn't match the vision of the country, even though it could be excellent in sport. We sit together and they tell us, no, don't do it this way, divert it this way a bit or try to change here and change there in order to have a one unified messaging uh, strategy, as I said, that goes out because it's not only the aim here. And we know quite well these days, these days, whatever you do, even in your own house, people will know about it a, a minute later uh, at the other side of the world. So uh, because of social media, because of the outreach. Yeah. And because of the global reach that everybody has, especially with the Internet. And that's actually thanks to that, that we can see each other now, even though we are miles apart. So but this is also has its uh, its dangers and it's it's, uh, let's say, um, potential creating harm as much as potential creating opportunities. So this is uh, uh, hopefully I, I answered your question as as much as I could. How will the ambassadors selected and trend for the occasion? Because they all they impress themselves so well you know we are really impressed by that no no it's thank you but it's all through training yes. first you have to your your uh, selection process has to be very specific and very particular uh, we picked two people one of them was Mataz Barsham the the guy who I was talking about the world champion yes. uh, in high jump uh, and uh, the other one uh, the lady uh, she's called Nada uh, Muhammad Aragji and the lady is the first uh, of one uh, of four uh, ladies that that represented Qatar in the Olympic Games. And literally, she was the first one to represent Qatar because she competed one day before the others. 
because oh. we, we all know swimming swimming is as she's in swimming and swimming is the first competition that starts because uh, they were in individual sports not in in team sports team yes. sports start way before that a uh, few two three days before but uh, uh, both of them have been well trained throughout the years not only for this presentation to uh, for public speaking and both of them have confidence in speaking yes. in front of, of the public that that made a big big uh, let's say that because. was a big factor of why yeah. we picked them of course we have other other people and maybe in in future bids we will have uh, we will give other people chance to be there but uh, for this bid in particular we thought that these two were uh, probably the best suited to represent our bid i hope that this was actually uh, a, 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 let's say a satisfactory answer Okay, so maybe we, I should give chance, give the floor to other participants if uh, the participant would like to raise the questions and uh, you can uh, press on the raise hands button. So now we have uh, Eugene. Hi, um, thank you uh, for the, uh, thank you Louise for your uh, presentation on the speech. And um, it's very impressive that Quarta have a such um, I mean, the successful in games and competition. So my question is that since Taiwan and uh, Korea have facing the same issue is that uh, our territory is not that big such as American, but you did have a successful com uh, successful outcome on the games. And as we can see in 2004 Athens, they are uh, they, they face financial crisis. So I would like to ask like so for uh, such small countries, how should we uh, have benefits throughout those um, games? How, how should we how should we success and how should we overcome? So according to you, what you mentioned about the clear vision, solid uh, journal strategy and soft tools, which among three, which would you think that that was the most key point of being successful throughout the games? I cannot, to be honest, I cannot pick one of the three. Without any of these ingredients, you will not, the other two cannot be used properly. However, uh, hopefully, uh, for any country, small or big, their ambition has to be big enough, but controlled enough. Because let's say if you have $10 in your pocket, you can't say with the $10, I'm going to buy a Ferrari. But what you can say, I'm going to invest it. And hopefully in a couple of years, if I invest it properly, I'll be able to buy the car. So again, this means when you want to host events, start from what you can do in the first, let's say, couple of events. Don't have your ambition. I want to go for the biggest event straight away. Start step by step, build yourself a, a profile with with the uh, international uh, organizations being the IOC, OCA, uh, even in, in, in your case, the, the regional, let's say, uh, uh, organization, and then hope for the others or let your ambition jump for the next phase and, and go for the others. As you as you saw, as you will see in the in the uh, in the presentation, as you saw, also in the video, we didn't actually start, even though we started with the Asian Games and that was a major, major step for us. And that had enough money for it set aside to actually host the games. And it cost a lot of money, I can tell you. At the time we had, we had the, the country was going through a boom in terms of petrol production, uh, gas and, and oil and gas, let's say. And we were lucky enough to have uh, a leadership that was willing to spare some money uh, for sports events again, because the vision was not only to uh, to to host the Asian Games, was to build part of the country through the Asian Games. Let's not forget, it's not only the positioning; it's it's you fast track your your uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, like and you you refer to Athens, for example, Athens uh, before the games, every government that was go going for elections, they were saying, "Oh, we will build you a new airport," because the airport was very old, was very dilapidated. Hardly anybody was happy going there. But because of the games, they had new ring roads and they had new airports. So the air, what the games did is it fast tracked projects that, that were always on the drawing table, but they were sitting there for years used as, as a, let's say, as a weapon for political parties to go to, uh, to elections and to try to win elections. Going back to your, to your question, all I can say is for a small country, have vision, have ambi ambition, draft a strategy, but let your strategy be uh, uh, practical enough and pragmatic enough so you don't, uh, let's say, take a major step or a bigger step that you can afford. Because eventually, if you have the money, you can reach. But as I said, if you have $10 with 
investing a proper investment, you can have 100, let's say, in a year, and then you can go for a bigger events. So hopefully uh, it's, it's clear. You have to be ambitious. Without ambition, you can't go anywhere. But then you have to use the, the, the three, at least the three. Of course, there are other, other uh, ingredients that, that you, can, uh, you can use, but be pragmatic in your approach. Thank you for your uh, explanation. It's really uh, impressive. Thank you so much. Well, hopefully that answered your question. If not, let me know and I can try to answer it in a different way. <laughs> uh, you say $10. So if they, if they are lucky, they buy the lottery, then they can buy the Ferrari right away. <laughs> I've been buying lottery for years and I wasn't lucky. So if you're lucky, think about me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for your information, that I would say that today probably our session should be called Australian Fever, but because uh, Louis is very like limited, right jump to the the topic that uh, I give him time to introduce himself. But I think he said he thinks that he already introduced himself in another presentation, so he didn't spend spend much time in that. That he's actually and also the nationality is Australian and uh, originally from Lebanon, but. Yeah, and uh, for, 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 for your information, Louis, today uh, we have two sessions in, ahead of yours. And the first one is ac actually the representative of Australian office in Taipei, so it's Australian. Oh. And the other one is uh, Anthony Edgar and, you know, former IOC oh, yes. uh, media. Yeah, you, I think you know him very of well. Course, of course. Yeah, yes, so yes. also Australian. So, and everyone is connected with Australia this, in this <laughs> afternoon session. And uh, also everyone is some kind of connection with 2000 Sydney Olympic Games and 2004 Anthem uh, Olympic Games. If uh, our dear participants, that uh, you can go back to look uh, at the information that uh, our colleague was sent to you, uh, that actually Luis is also in uh, work for the 2004 Anthem Olympic Games as well. Yes. Yeah. So and, we and, are. And Sydney 2000 is close yes. to my heart because that was the start <laughs> of my sports career. Very yes. close. To my heart. So, and now we have another question. Actually, this question is uh, raised before we were collected before 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 this session. So it's from Debbie. Okay. But Debbie, I think I saw okay. she, I see she's online. Maybe Debbie would like to bring this question herself or found you. No, so OK. Uh, her question is during the bidding process. I think I think she's trying to ask. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Hello, I'm Fang Yu, and I'd like to ask for the uh, for Doha 2030 Asian Games. What is the biggest challenge for you during the bidding process uh, procedure, Ooh. and how do you solve it or deal with it? Could you share yeah. with us? Thank well, you. Well, yes. Oh, th there are there are some challenges that we can share and some that we can't. But uh, two of the major challenges, one of them was the time, because for example, uh, uh, usually you need, um, I think they give you six to, uh, to nine months to present your bid book. They gave us three months to work on it. And of course, at the end, they, they uh, gave us an extension of, uh, I think, six weeks. But by that time, we worked day and night to try to finish it. And it was just after that, it was just a matter of trying to print it and try to, let's say, if I, I like to use the word massage it in order to fit the uh, what, what the OCA want. But before they gave us, and, and by the way, the extension was given to us on the literally the last day. So everything was ready, but we didn't have time to print. We told them we cannot print. And I think our competition, which at the time was uh, Saudi Arabia, also they, they had some uh, some challenges in terms of meeting the deadline. But that was the biggest challenge. And everything uh, at the end, everything also was connected to that. Everything was cramped in terms of time. We were not given enough, which usually uh, the, let's say the enough time that's usually given to to bidding cities. The other major challenge is split in two. One is the political situation. We were still in an embargo by our our uh, neighboring countries. Thank God now it's it's gone. Everybody is back being good friends, but that's part of life. And the other side of this is unfortunately COVID. We, when we started bidding, it was the start of the COVID, and COVID was booming all around the world. So we could not, we could not actually bid properly. We didn't have a chance to interact with anyone, except, uh, and and OCA actually didn't want us to visit anybody because this is part of the of the rules of any bidding. You cannot visit anyone. Nobody can visit you except after they get the approval of OCA, and it has to be for for business 
that is not related to the games. But what they did at the end, because we didn't even have a chance to, to interact with anyone, they gave us a chance to visit a specific number of countries. We decided on the countries with them. It was not a specific country, but a specific number of countries because they gave us only about 10 to 12 days. So our colleagues visited, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 11, 11 countries in a matter of 12 days. Basically what they did, they went to the Olympic committees and they presented our project to them, hoping for, which is what usually happens in, in normal meetings. So these were the two, uh, let's say, biggest challenges, the time and the political environment, which is which was accompanied by an unfortunate pandemic that was hitting the world all over. So thank you, Luis. Um, so any other question? Okay. Uh, Ke Shaolong. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, so it's just like out of curiosity, and my question is, I know like now Qatar is like hosting the 2030 um, Asian Games, and we all know that Qatar is in a kind of like almost all of the land is in desert, so it's like very hot during the full year. And I know there is like this is this is an issue like aroused when you're hosting a FIFA World Cup. And like I'm just curious about if you have any plans about like facing this issue to not like when athletes come because obviously like in Asian games there are a lot of sports or um, there are like outdoor sports and how are you going to deal with this issue? Thank you. Yes. One thing I need to clarify to you. Yes, we are in the desert, but we still have seasons. So <laughs> the, the toughest part of the year is now. Like, uh, I'm sorry, but you can see probably sometimes I'm trying to sneeze a bit or something. I'm trying to hide because for the last four days, we've been suffering from a major sandstorm, which means my house now, I'm, I'm floating in, in sand in my house. Whatever you happens, you still so I will I will have a major cleaning issue uh, later today. That's not the issue. The issue is, even though we live in the desert, first uh, we developed as a country, and when you are in Doha, you don't feel everywhere that you're in a desert. And the other thing is, we have seasons, and most of our events are targeted towards the latter part of the season, which is the winter part. In winter, it's perfect for sport here because even the coldest days. We don't go, the temperature doesn't go less than 10, 11 degrees Celsius, which is perfect for, for sports people. And most of our target in terms of timing is between October and March, which is the perfect season in Qatar and in the region, not only in Qatar. It, the same could be said about Dubai, the same could be said about Saudi Arabia, the same, the same could be said about Oman and all these countries, uh, the neighboring countries, because then, and, and for the people who had a chance to come to the Asian Games in 2006, Actually, 14 out of the 16 days of the 2006, it was raining. And that's probably, it rained in that year as much as it rained from then until now, because usually it rains two or three days a year here. Okay, so it's the temperature is very nice. And now even the FIFA World Cup, even though we have the technology and we're using the technology to air condition the, the stadia, most of the stadia that will be used for the uh, World Cup are have air condition inside inside them, and that's I'm talking about the field. I'm not talking about the closed areas, okay? But we managed to convince FIFA that it's better in order to create the atmosphere, the, the, that's, let's say the festive atmosphere that any major event needs. It's better to move it to to December, and they they uh, accepted that. So the World Cup is going to happen from the middle of November until the middle of December. And our proposed time for the Asian Games in 2030 is actually in December. Of course, the details of when, when, from when to when, it's going to be worked out with the OCA in the next few years, but December, which is hopefully a great time to be in the region. So hopefully that answers your question. And that's, <coughs> sorry, uh, that has been one of the major difficulties for us in our negotiations with the IOC in terms of hosting the Olympic Games. Because in the Olympic Games, the rule is still until now, and hopefully they will change it in the future, the rule is you can only host the games or organize the games between early June and end of August, which means Qatar cannot do it. Dubai cannot do it. India cannot do it. Uh, let's say even a challenge for, for uh, Indonesia and some of the Southeast Asian countries. We've seen in the Asian Games 2018, it was a challenge to have, uh, let's say, a lot of humidity and, and, uh, and, uh, and heat. And this is what we will face in Tokyo, because also Tokyo is part of that. 
So in order to create, uh, let's say, the perfect environment for athletes to compete without an impact on their health, for this region specifically, the, 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 the fourth quarter of the year and the first quarter of the year are the best and they are almost perfect for, for any athlete. So we do live in desert, but we have a way to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, thank you for answering my question because I'm just like really curious because we do not live in that region and apparently like different countries have different condition of their environment and how to deal with all these conditions and make sure that every country have a chance to hold major events is really important. So. Absolutely, absolutely. And hopefully that's what I'm saying. Absolutely. I agree with you and hopefully the IOC also will show uh, flexibility in that sense. But of course, the IOC has a lot of factors of why they can't do it. And it's mostly related to the broadcasters and the money that comes into the Olympic movement from broadcasters is is uh, is not a small amount that you can ignore. So you need to yeah. fulfill their needs as, as much as uh, fulfill our needs. They pour the money. We have to respect their uh, their wishes in terms of the timing because they have to make their money back and they make it from several competitions, not only Olympic Games and Olympic movement related events. Yeah, that's very practical. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> They're the one who pouring the money. I mean, a lot of the money is, is being put by them. <laughs> OK, so uh, also to uh, Saolong's questions, actually, we uh, went to, as, as Luis just mentioned, we were participant in the uh, 2019 ANOC uh, World Beach Games. And actually, the, the, the weather at that time is quite nice. Of course, uh, during some because it's beach games, so all the activities happens on the beach, and uh, it 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 did have some occasionally some um, you know to the heat the problem with the heat, but I think the organizing community dealing is very very well. Yes, well, we tried to push it to November actually because it's a better uh, timing, but unfortunately because of the international sports calendar, Anok insisted that even though we changed October. location. Yeah. Yes, they insisted on the exact times that San Diego was supposed to uh, to to organize awesome. the games. Yeah. So we didn't have a lot of choice in that. We wanted to have it at least a month after. We were just pushing for a month because then also, as you said, Ivy, don't forget, because it's beach games, the, the water temperature is very important. And the water temperature at the time was just at the edge, whereas if we shifted it by one month, it would have been much better. But thank God we had, we had only one or actually two swimming competitions. If we had more in open water, that would have been probably a, a bigger uh, reason for, for us to push it. But we had only the marathon Apostle, swimming Apostle. and the triathlon. Yeah. OK, so we have uh, another question from Helen. I believe you might be uh, familiar with. No, we are not friends. <laughs> <laughs> I am friends with everyone. I may not work, but I'm friends with everybody. <laughs> OK, thank Helen. you, Luis. Uh, my question is, the Qatar Olympic Committee has announced it will be undertaking a gender equality review. Yes. So could you tell us about more about this? Thank you. I can't tell you more because it's still in the early stages. But uh, what I can tell you is that in Qatar Olympic Committee now, and especially after Olympic Agenda 2020 and with Olympic Agenda 2020 plus five, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, it, it takes a lot of time to uh, to actually explain about them, but they are the, the roadmap that was drafted by President Thomas Bach for the Olympic movement since he took over. So in order for us to try to be compliant with Agenda 2020 and considering that the region here um, <coughs> is mostly, domi sorry, mostly dominated by, by men uh, in, in, uh, in, in, let's say, uh, higher positions, uh, this actually started years before. It didn't start now, but now it's more being formalized because uh, we're trying to give more chances for women to actually not only do sport, but be part of the leadership of, of uh, sports organizations. And it will take time. In any country, it will take time. And regardless, I, ha I have to admit, the whole sports world 20 years ago was dominated by men. And 10 years ago was half dominated by men. So uh, it's happening bit by bit, even in the IOC. They, it took them a lot of time to reach something like close to gender equality. And now we're, we're from our side, we're doing the same. And uh, hopefully uh, it will be a first in the region. Uh, we've already given a chance. And as uh, Ivy said in the presentation that we had for the bid, we had more women than men, which is something that uh, is first done by us, uh, even though it's not the first time. Like our, uh, our bid for the 2020 Olympic Games, the CEO was a lady. 
So it's not something, again, it's not something that we started uh, yesterday or, or let's say when we announced this, but it's, it takes a lot of effort. It's not easy. It takes a lot of effort because also in the region, women themselves, they need a lot of support in order to reach high, high uh, uh, let's say, uh, positions, support from their families as well as from the society at, at, at large. And um, I can say one thing, and hopefully men will not take it against me, I'm more impressed with women in the region than men because they have commitment and they have uh, desire not to prove themselves, but to reach the highest possible positions. And they know how to work for it. This is a very, very important uh, aspect. They work hard to, to reach there. It's not that they want to get it because I am the uh, cousin of this or I am related to that, because we know in the region it's all about, uh, mostly it's about who you are in terms of who you are related to. But in terms of women here, be it young girls, I mean, in the, uh, as soon as they uh, graduate from school, not originally from, from university, until they reach the professional life, they work very hard towards their goals, especially their professional goals. So hopefully this will be, I can't give you more details, unfortunately, again, not because I don't want to, because the whole strategy and the whole, let's say, uh, framework is being studied as, as, we are, uh, as, as we are going along. Okay, thank you. And we have another question from Ivan Ye. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, clear. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. Dries, my name is Ivan. Uh, I'm working on the National Taiwan Normal University Special Education. I was responsible for the person with a disability in sport. So, mm -hmm. Actually, besides the Asian games, they have another games, the Asian para games. Um, yes. They were used to separate hold before, but since 2010, these two games will um, were hold in the same year, same country, and the same city, because we believe the sport can create an inclusive society. So my question is, what do you think about these two games hold in the same place? same year, same time, and uh, do QOC and the QPC work together to organize the game or do they prepare separately? Yeah, thank you. No problem. Um, before we go about the games, uh, QPC, Qatar Paralympic Committee, is considered as one of the, uh, let's say, um, one of the super, let's say, uh, national federations for us. Okay, like when I say super, it means one of the major ones. It's not really uh, completely independent because we are the umbrella of the uh, of Olympic and Paralympic sport in the country, but uh, they are considered as one of the major players in the uh, in the in the Paralympic sport. And uh, uh, to be honest, we've already hosted uh, IPC Athletics World Championship in 2015, apart from the smaller events that we do in Qatar. But uh, that was the major uh, Paralympic sport event that we hosted in Qatar, and hopefully things will develop more in, in the near future. Um, in terms of the uh, hosting both events, I think it's hopefully they will continue with it. Uh, but I think it's a major uh, plus for both in terms of inclusiveness, because now we know that IOC is pushing uh, for the games to be inclusive of everybody. And this is one of the uh, let's say uh, the mechanisms of, of achieving that is to go between Olympic and Paralympic hand in hand. And we've, we know that it's been happening in the same city for a while. And it's actually less burden on the city itself because the venues are there. It's almost the same venues. You have to adapt a bit in terms of accessibility. But recently, the major advantage has been that the accessibility has been thought of like legacy from day one. So from day one, they think, I'm not only having Olympic Games, but I'm having Paralympic Games. So if I have many steps, I need to create accessible path. I'm, to, I'm giving a, a small example. I mean, it's not as simple as that, but it's now you have legacy, you have accessibility, you have inclusiveness. It's all part of, uh, uh, of the strategy that you start from day one. And this has been a reflection of the, uh, let's say, close partnership between the IOC and the IPC. And hopefully this will continue. Again, resources, it's for the benefit of everybody, but especially for the benefit of the Paralympic sports, because uh, I have to admit, they've been um, a bit uh, under the radar, if we can say, for many years, 
until the last 10 or 15 years when they started, uh, let's say, working hand in hand with, with Olympic sports. So hopefully this will continue um, and hopefully it will help in developing Paralympic sports as well, more than what uh, it has gone through the last few years. Okay. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Okay, so actually we are kind of a little bit over time, but still if anyone has questions, we might can take one or two. Don't worry, I will send you the bill soon. I will send you a, <laughs> an updated bill. <laughs> no, just, it's up to you guys. For me, I'm all yours. Well, whatever oh, okay. questions you have, <laughs> I'm all yours. The last one, Zhang Chen. Hello, hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, good afternoon, um, Mr. Lewis and everyone. Um, my question might a little bit be off topic, um, but I just want, I, I would like to ask that um, now that we've experienced uh, the pandemic and which is still going on even um, uh, with lockdowns and quarantines and everything going on, and after what happened to um, Tokyo 2020 and this year uh, and even last year, uh, many events were postponed and some even canceled, right? And what, what are the future challenges if lesser country are interested or even able to host um, any major events? Yeah, that's like my, what I'm curious about. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, it's not only the pandemic, actually, that's creating challenges for smaller countries to host major events. It's the size of these events as well. And this has been a major problem that's being uh, studied and well considered by many. Not only the IOC is considering it as well by uh, creating, let's say, the chance uh, not only for one city like before. Before it was just one city ho bidding to host events. Now it's creating a chance to many cities, to even countries in order to use the infrastructure that the countries have or in order to make sure that the games fit within the long term planning of the country and not the other way around. They don't want countries to actually try to host games and spend billions on 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 uh, building, let's say, infrastructure and, and uh, stadiums when at the end of the games, probably hardly anybody will use them. So one uh, one major uh, challenge will be the size of the events themselves. And in fact, one thing officially that has been also not only by the IOC officially announced by the Commonwealth Games that after Birmingham, I think Birmingham is the next one in 2022, they will sit down and reconsider the size of the games, the number of sports, the number of venues. So everybody's thinking about it from a from a very uh, practical way, because what the pandemic has has been a wake up call for countries and for societies that uh, not a lot of money is being spent on where it should be spent. Of course, sport is very important because we all know the people who had a good immune system were mostly the people, not all of them, but if you did sport, you had a better chance to fight the, uh, the COVID-19 because your body is equipped enough to actually fight it. And plus sport, like now, for example, the Euro is happening and the Copa America is happening and everybody's saying that this has been uh, let's say a, a positive, uh, let's say, uh, or a positive impact in terms of society after all the gloom and doom that's been happening, especially in Europe, in parts of Europe that have gone through a very bad, uh, let's say, fight with the pandemic, and more especially in Latin America, which is still suffering until now. So at least the games are taking minds of people away from the problems that we're facing on an, uh, an everyday level because of the pandemic. And also what's happening is that countries now are able, and we have gone through it in the last year, we're able to host events in pandemic without putting any pressure on the health system in the country. So this is also a challenge that we may have to face because let's face it, in Rio, just before Rio, we had the Zika. Zika, of course, was not as big as the COVID, but it's still, it was still a major challenge for Brazil at, some, at, at that time. It was Zika was was a virus that was not as big again as COVID, but it's still, it was still there. It was killing people in Brazil, and thank God it was only in Brazil. Of course, we feel sympathy with all the ones who lost people because of Zika there. But 
it was still a challenge, a major challenge for the country. So now every country, small or big, because of this pandemic, needs to be well equipped from every aspect, including the health aspect of how to fight a pandemic if something like this happens in the future. So hopefully this was a wake up call and it was it, it was like, a, if I can say, a, a, let's say a reason for people to consolidate their resources and, and set up a, a list of priorities in terms of their development, not based on money or based on fame or based on show off, but based on practical things, including if they want the money, including if they want the show off. But that will be all, uh, hopefully a smaller uh, ingredient instead, instead of being the, the major one. Thank you, Luis. And I think now we have accepted the final question, and that's from Christine. Ah. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Luis. Hi. I'm Christine from Chinese Taipei Olympic Committee. I just have Sorry, one Christine. last question. I have to admit to everybody, I've been giving Christine a lot of hard time in the last uh, couple of months, but she was great uh, and she was always being there. Yeah, she's and working very hard to make this session a success. Well, I'm course. thankful to connect with you like from afar, yeah. especially during a time that we can't have you here personally. But I just have one question about um, the marketing strategy for cities, especially when uh, both Taipei City and New Taipei City are going to host the 2025 World Masters Games. So is there any marketing strategy that you would advise us to do? Because uh, we have lesser like infrastructure as Qatar and also the fact that you have been to Taiwan yourself. Is there any uh, marketing strategy uh, for our cities in order for like the world to know more about us? And maybe like in the future, we will have more chance to host multi-sport games. Um, the big advantage that you guys have now that, uh, <clears throat> sorry, did not exist a few years back is social media. Huh. With social media, <laughs> you don't have to spend a lot of money, but you can have a bigger reach than we had, let's say, for 2006. Or even when I visited uh, Taiwan in, if I'm not mistaken, I visited Taiwan in 2006 or 2005, something like that. So it was 15, 16 years ago. I'm sure that the, the city and the country is different now from when it was then. And hopefully after the pandemic, I'll have a chance to visit again. Yeah, we'll come. But yes, well, hopefully. It has to be an integrated marketing campaign. And it has, as I said, it has to have the support of everybody because you can't go around trying to promote and market your event when other parties, especially in the government, are doing things against you. So you have to have and, and uh, if you're hosting the Masters Games, the Masters Games is a completely different audience. We're talking about people who have retired from active sport, uh, from professional active sport in most cases, not in every case, because we know in some uh, in some sports, people can like in equestrian and shooting, you can still be a pro athlete when you're in your 60s. Uh, so it's a different, it's a completely different audience, which it may be a bit easier because you don't have to convince them a lot as they are professionals, but you have to have the right approach. And as I said, the biggest tip I can give you is you have to have an integrated approach and one that is supported by everyone. So you need to actually work on getting the support for your marketing campaign before you, you, uh, you launch it. But then also you need to be ready to deal with any kind of, uh, if I can call it the rogue agents, as, as it's known in the, uh, I'm watching too many series these days because of the lockdown, but these rogue agents that may go not against, but outside of the strategy that you set up, you need to be able to have a plan B to deal with them, not deal with them, get rid of them, but to to, uh, to see, to to actually try to, if I can say, uh, pacify their impact so that their impact would be lesser and lesser in terms of your uh, overall marketing strategy. But this is again, I mean, marketing is a big world and it needs it needs a, a lot of time. And I'm sure you have people who know uh, what they're doing. But the only tip I could give you, as I said, is work hand in hand with your government, work hand in hand with your media, work hand in hand with your private sector, which basically is all the stakeholders in the world and in the, in the country. And uh, you should be OK. 
Thank you, Louise. It's really a pity that we only have one hour to have you sharing your experience with us today. And uh, this afternoon is really a wonderful session. And uh, we really hope that uh, maybe some final words, as you know, that this session is our international sports uh, affairs training course. So what's the final words that you will for our participants if they want to be uh, international, you know, the we will say the organizer or the uh, they want to work for some international sports uh, organization or even they maybe want to, you know, recruit by your QRC or for your OC. <laughs> then you what's tied the recommendation and the final words that you were for them? What I can say first is you are the luckiest people in the world because you picked the best field you can ever pick. And I'm a good example. I'm not saying I'm not bragging about myself, but I studied many years to actually get my architecture and my urban design degrees. And when I got a chance to jump into sport, I didn't even hesitate. I left everything behind because it's a very enjoyable, mind you, very stressful field. I mean, you can see the white, all these <laughs> white hair are because of the events we worked on and because of my wife. I hope she's not listening now, but she's not. <laughs> but uh, uh, so no, but seriously speaking, it's a very enjoyable uh, field or a career that you're in. But uh, the other tip I can tell you, and probably this applies to every every uh, let's say career, not only in sport, is that keep learning. Don't think that if you work on a major event, especially hopefully you have you will have the chance to work on a major event that that's it. I've done it. I know everything now. No, keep learning. Keep sharing your, your experiences, keep discussing with people. The world, the, the good thing about the world of sport is that people are coming with a sports background. We, they don't have to be professional sports uh, people, but it's, it's they all have sport in them, which means they all have the kind of approach, approachable aspect in them. They're approachable, they're friendly. You want to discuss things with them. You want to take their advice. Of course, not everybody may actually uh, give you the right advice, but this is life. You will get the right, the right and the wrong. But in sport, you have a better chance to get the right advice from more people than probably other uh, other uh, careers. So keep learning, keep sh sharing, and learn your lessons from everything in life. And whatever you learn from sport can be applied in life in all aspects of your life, including at home. If you have a wife and kid or wife and kids, the same will apply. Imagine if you don't, if you succeed in a sports team, you will succeed in a, in sports administration, especially in international relations because it's about dealing with people from different cultures and this is one of the big pluses that at, uh, you will have hopefully if you continue your career in, in international relations or uh, working on international events this thank is you in thank you louis and thank you <laughs> dear participant for joining us uh, this afternoon and see you louis in tokyo and hopefully we will see you I not hope near, so. I in hope the near so. future in taiwan as well <laughs> I hope so, because in Tokyo, you all know quite well we're going to a prison, so we, we may not be, yeah. be able to so see we, each we other. We can have coffee so every every afternoon in the athletes' village. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> There's okay. nothing else to do. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Good luck, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.